Welcome to Genesis Unleashed, where we unleash the truth of Genesis. And on today's show, give theistic evolutionists some things to think about. Welcome to Genesis Unleashed, and on today's program we want to talk about theistic evolution. Uh, yes, combining evolution and millions of years with Genesis. That seems to be, unfortunately, a growing, uh, a growing notion nowadays, as, as bizarre as that may sound to some of you that are Christians who are watching, there are organizations that are growing in popularity, like BioLogos and so on. We need to do a, a program just focusing on that specifically, right. that, that, uh, that are saying, there's no conflict between creation and evolution. Just believe in both. Right. No Theistic problem. evolution. Theistic evolution. And, God and, used evolution. And we get to uh, see in my speakers, we have uh, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ challenge us on a regular basis when we're out presenting at churches, and they'll, they'll bring many things up and say, well, listen, you know, we, we've got to accept science and, and, uh, and incorporate that into the Bible. Um, now, we, of course, see this as a non-biblical conclusion. Uh, but sure. really, I mean, our job when we're out uh, speaking at, at churches is not to bash fellow Christians or get into arguing with fellow Christians. Our goal is to go into the church and present God's Word as truth, uh, beginning from the very first birth, and, and, and uphold the authority of the Scripture. That's what we're there to do, not yeah, to argue with yeah. fellow Christians. And, and we see our job as one of encouraging the church and encouraging pastors, equi helping pastors equip their congregations with an encouraging message mm -hmm. that science supports the Bible. You start with that that faith that we have there in the scripture, you start with God's word, belief in that, and when you do that, science comes in and supports it. Biology, geology, genetics, and so on, supports God creating recently in six literal days followed by a global flood. Right. So um, we understand this isn't a, a salvation issue in the sense that, you know, if you believe in evolution, you can't be saved or, or anything like that. I mean, the young earth creationists have been uh, accused of that uh, many yeah. times, but that's really not our stance at all. And you no, can see should, that on our we website. we should make that clear. It's yeah. not a salvation issue. Uh, you, don't even need, you don't need to even to know the names Adam and Eve in order to become a follower of Christ. Right. Now, let, let's, let's add this, though, before we go too far. Um, in order to be consistent, the gospel does begin in Genesis. A real first Adam back in, back in Genesis is a requirement in order for the theology of the last Adam, Jesus Christ, to be consistent. So we just, just, just balance, it, balance it out there. Right. No, it's not a salvation issue, but for consistency's sake, uh, it, it does matter what you believe about Genesis. It matters very much. Right. Now, we find that most people are very enthusiastic when uh, they see CMI presentations done at, uh, done at a church because they, many people have come up and said, well, wow, I finally get answers to some of these questions, Absolutely. you know, and they're excited yep. that they can trust the Bible, they don't have to, you know, morph it around or anything like that. But again, we're not there to argue with, uh, you know, Christian brothers and sisters. So when I'm asked those things, and, and I'm sure when CMI speakers all over the world are asked those things, what CMI tries to do is, is just show them, well, Look at what atheists are saying about this topic. What would you yeah. say if, an, if, if you are a theistic evolutionist and you're witnessing to a non-believer and you say, yes, I accept evolution in millions of years, and, and you say that to the skeptic, let's look at what the skeptic is going to try to ask you or, or kind of, you know, might present to you because of your position. And then in that way, well, perhaps we can help those, those Christians that have uh, adopted millions of years in evolution as their, their, as their belief. Right. Perhaps that yeah. will help them at least get prepared for when the skeptic comes along and, uh, and, and tries to, to do that. Yeah, and what we want to do on today's program is, is just, it's going to be a lot of quotes yes. from atheists, from evolutionists, to see how the atheists and evolutionists attack that position of theistic evolution, right. both together. Yeah, a lot of quotes here on today's show, but uh, hopefully this will be helpful to you. Um, 
Now, the first thing we want to want to say is, you know, sometimes we encounter Christians. It's just like, well, let's just not talk about this. That that's not going to help. No. Uh, by not talking about, uh, you know, evolution or, or even many pastors would say, well, we don't want to have a speaker in because this is going to be controversial. But uh, we don't think that's the best way to go. But let's have the discussion and work through it to a, to a God glorifying answer. That's the way to go. <laughs> exactly. Now, uh, our first quote here is from uh, physics professor Bob Park, and uh, this was quoted in, from New Scientist magazine. And a new scientist asked him, when did you become a skeptic? He's a non-believer. He says, well, it was about when I was 12. I was going to a youth group within the Methodist church, which had hired a pastor to work with teenagers. I had a couple of problems with the biblical accounts, including Genesis, that clearly could not be taken as literal truth. I chatted to the pastor and explained my concerns. Instead of debating with me, he said, you can go to hell as quickly for doubting as you can for stealing. That violated everything I felt. Well, I can actually understand his, his point. <laughs> We're not right. to be blind faith Christians. We, you know, it's, the Bible says, come let us reason together. Uh, we should be able to ask questions about our faith. If, if we have a solid faith, we should be able to ask questions. And, and you're not going to go to hell because you ask questions about the scripture. That's right, yeah. Now, there's a, the good example, the, a good example there to bring up that's, that, that many people bring up is, is Thomas, often called Doubting Thomas. Yeah. I think he gets a bad rap, <laughs> Thomas. He wasn't there to see the resurrected Christ with the other ten apostles. And the other ten were excited. They, t they tell, P they tell uh, uh, Thomas about it. And he says, well, I'm not going to believe unless I get the evidence. The same evidence that the other ten already had. Right. And did Jesus deny him that evidence? No. Hmm. The next time he saw him, Thomas, come here. Look at, look, look at the nail prints in my hand. L examine me. It, it's me. I'm back, to, I'm back from the dead. Right. Uh, there's another quote here from uh, Dan Brown. You recognize Dan Brown as the author of the, uh, of the Da Vinci Code. Well, he's not a Christian either. He says this, I was raised Episcopalian and I was very religious as a kid. Then in eighth or ninth grade, I studied astronomy, cosmology, and the origins of the universe. I remember saying to a minister, I don't get it. I read a book that said there was an explosion known as the Big Bang, but here it says God created heaven and earth and the animals in seven days. Which is right? Unfortunately, the response I got was, nice boys don't ask that question. <laughs> a, light, a light went off. I said, the Bible doesn't make sense. Science makes much more sense to me. And I just gravitated away from religion. Right. So not discussing this really isn't an option. Um, you know, right. Many people, you know, they've got all these doubts in it and they, they want to discuss it. Now, I think a lot of Christians have come to the point of uh, theistic evolution because they, they, you know, the first couple of quotes were people who, well, let's not talk about it. Some other Christians have thought just not very deeply about it. They just take the surface position, well, God used evolution, that, that we don't have to think about it much. Yes. And uh, that's, that's not a very good position either because um, yeah. the, the, the other team is thinking about it, so to speak. Now, uh, this next uh, quote is uh, an interview with Jacques Monod. Uh, way back in uh, 1976, of course, uh, Monod was an atheist and an evolutionist. And, uh, but the interviewer, John, uh, is a Christian. And uh, John has adopted evolution as the means that God created. And so as he's discussing this with Mo, Mano, some interesting uh, things come to light. So John, the Christian, the interviewer. One could conceive of God using randomness just so long as there was a pattern which he was imposing upon the results of the chance mutations. Now, we should probably stop and <laughs> there for a second. I mean, if you look at what John just said, he, he's contradicting himself. There's, a, there's a, a pattern upon which God is imposing on the chance mutations. I mean, he, he's obviously not thinking very clearly at all. Right. And, and actually, Monod is quite the gentleman in his response, uh, even as an atheist, he, you know, answering this. He says, well, if you want to assume that, then I have no dispute with you, except one, which is not a scientific one, and not a scientific dispute, but a moral one. Interesting how the atheist responds. Namely, selection is the blindest and most cruel way of evolving new species and more and more complex and refined organisms. Now the Christian, John, he says, cruel? Minot, the more cruel because it's a process of elimination of destruction. The struggle for life and elimination of the weakest is a horrible process against which our whole modern ethics um, revolts. An ideal society is a non-selective society and one where the weak is protected which is exactly the reverse of the so-called natural law. And Monod finished off saying, I'm surprised that a Christian would defend the, the idea that this is the process which God more or less set up in order to have evolution. 
So the atheists are definitely thinking about this question, the whole theistic evolution and so on, as, as Minode clearly has. Uh, the, the, the part of the problem with blending evolution and the Bible is what do you do with good and bad? And, right. and as Minode pointed out here, uh, it, evolution requires the extinction of billions and billions of unfit varieties of animals to evolve the ever higher creatures, uh, leading, leading eventually up to humans. Right. Uh, and, and Minode can see the problem there. Well, that's the number one philosophical question, right, for the existence of God. Yes. If you've got such a loving God, how come there's so much death and pain in the world? And if you adopt theistic evolution as your answer, well, God used millions of years of pain and death to create, so you don't have an answer. You can't point and say, well, wait a sec, God created a perfect world. Sin and death entered because of mankind's rebellion, right? Adam rebelled against God, said, I don't want to, you know, I, I want to basically live autonomously. I don't want to have to obey what you, you, you say or, or right. play by your rules. I want to do it by myself. And God said, okay, you can do that. So, you know, the death that, that happens in this world is a result of sin. It's a punishment. It's just like any crime that's committed. You hope that there's a, actually a punishment administered for it. Right. So, yeah. um, but you don't have a good answer if, uh, if you believe that. So. Yeah. Here's another quote from David Hull. The problem that biological evolution poses for natural theologians is the sort of God that a Darwinian version of evolution implies. The evolutionary process is rife with happenstance, contingency, incredible waste, death, pain, and horror. Whatever the God implied by evolutionary theory and the data of natural history may be like, he is not the Protestant God of waste not, want not. He is also not a loving God who cares about his productions. The God of the Galapagos is careless, wasteful, indifferent, almost diabolical. He's certainly not the sort of God to whom anyone would be inclined to pray. This is something that atheists have captured Ouch. on for, yeah, yeah. for a long time. This, you know, this God of death is basically what you're talking about here. Right. Uh, death is not the result of uh, its uh, transgression. It's just how God operates. I mean, Bertrand Russell was a very, very famous and influential uh, atheist. Um, and uh, he, he had a lecture, Why I'm Not a Christian, which got you know, made into kind of a, a booklet form. And he said this, when you come to look at, into this argument from design, it is most astonishing thing that people believe that this world, with all the things that are in it, with all its defects, should be the best that omnipotence and omnis, uh, omniscience have been able to produce in millions of years. I really can't believe it. See, again, he's looking at it from an evolutionary point of view. It's like, why would, why would a loving God create like this? Yeah, it, it doesn't make any sense. And there's other people who've recognized this as well. Carl Sagan, a famous astronomer from years ago, he said this, If God is omnipotent and omniscient, why didn't he start the universe out in the first place so it would come out the way that he wants? Why is he constantly repairing and complaining? No, there's one thing the Bible makes clear. The biblical God is a sloppy manufacturer. He's not good at design. He's not good at execution. He'd be out of business if there was any other competition. <laughs> and, and he's saying that the, the one thing the Bible makes clear, but it's not the Bible that makes that clear. The Bible no. makes things very clear if there was no death and struggle. But he's saying because he's seeing th things through evolutionary lenses that, that the Bible doesn't make sense. Right, because he's, he's, he's blending... He's, well, he's, that's kind of a confused argument there. He's blending millions of years with, with the Bible and then saying, well, the Bible makes that clear. It but, doesn't. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So atheist Irvin DeVore, uh, and we'll finish this segment with this uh, quote. Um, he's a Harvard University anthropologist. He said, I personally cannot discern a shred of evidence for a benign cosmic presence. I look at evolution and I see indifference and capriciousness. What kind of God works with a 99.9% .9 extinction rate? We'll see. You know, you were saying how um, Carl Sagan, he, he's doing the same thing. He's an right. atheist, or a professed atheist. He believes in millions of years in evolution. And so then when he looks at the Bible, he says it doesn't make sense. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, there's, uh, philosophically, uh, Christians who've accepted evolution can't answer the, the, probably the number one question. Why is there death and suffering in the world? That's right. kind of where all of this is heading. Mm -hmm. And you can see that in these, these uh, atheist quotes uh, from the evolutionists here as well. Uh, Darwinian, Darwin historian Peter, uh, historian Peter Bowler, uh, who was in our, um, we interviewed him in our, in our Voyage documentary. That's right. Uh, he said this, If Christians accepted that humanity was the product of evolution, even assuming the process could be seen as an expression of the Creator's will, then the whole idea of original sin would have to be reinterpreted. Far from, 
falling from an original state of grace in the Garden of Eden, we have risen gradually from our animal origins. And if there was no sin from which we needed salvation, what was the purpose of Christ's agony on the cross? Christ became merely the perfect man who showed us that we could all hope to become, uh, who showed us what we could all hope to become when evolution finished its upward course. Right. So now, hmm. all of a sudden, you can't answer the number one philosophical question. Number right. two, you've just opened up this huge theological problem uh, by, by adopting this. Original Absolutely. sin yeah. needs to be totally um, you know, reinterpreted. And the atheist, again, they, they notice it right away. Yeah, and they just go for the heart. Yep. I mean, the, 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 the position of theistic evolution, the, the atheists attack it. Um, along with us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it, it, it doesn't make sense biblically, and, it's, and it doesn't make sense from their perspective either. Right. So the atheist is saying, when you look at evolution, when you believe in evolution, the Bible doesn't make sense. And one of the most disturbing things because of that is the fact of how atheists are actually searching out Christians who have adopted that position to help them promote evolution because they know it will turn more people to atheism. And you can see that in the quotes from some that, famous atheists. That should make the red flags go up right there. Exactly. Okay. If they're looking to recruit <laughs> you so that they can produce more atheists, yeah, the alarm bell yeah. should be going off. So here's uh, atheist Eugenie Scott, and she said, I would describe myself as a humanist or non-theist. I have found that the most effective allies for evolution are people of the faith community. One clergyman with a backward collar is worth two biologists at a school board meeting any day. Now, Eugenie Scott, uh, she's an anti-creationist, she's an anti-Christian, she's a leader of the atheist founded and operated and pretentiously uh, named uh, National Center for Science Education. Yeah, um, National Center for Evolutionary Indoctrination. And atheism cool. creation. <laughs> yes. yeah. um, and, and look what she's saying here. Yeah, let, let's, let's get a couple of uh, you know, Christians who believe in evolution because that's going to help our cause out uh, greatly. Right. Yeah, and uh, self-avowed um, atheist Michael Zimmerman is, uh, is, is taking up the challenge, I suppose. Look at what he says. Uh, Dear Reverend, here's a letter that he's, uh, the Atheist Clergy Project, very interesting. Dear Reverend, fill in the blank, I'm writing to you in the hope that you will join together with thousands of clergy and congregations to demonstrate that religion and science can comfortably coexist. Well, he doesn't mean science, he means evolution. That's, that's, what he, that's where he's heading. Now, who is this guy? Well, he's an atheist, and he's come up with the Clergy Letter Project. So, He's an atheist, and he contacts Christian churches. churches to get them to celebrate Darwin, to celebrate evolution. So you can picture the conversation, you know, ring, 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 hello. Hi, is this Pastor Bob? Yeah. Hi, this is Michael Zimmerman. Hey, listen, Pastor, you know, uh, um, you, know you seem like a, a man of science, you know, uh, uh, you believe in evolution. Um, hey, look, why don't you come celebrate, you know, this, this Darwin celebration and get your congregation involved and, and show them how, you know, they can believe in science and still be faithful. And by the way, I'm an atheist, but, but I'm just trying to get you on board. Just trying to help you out. <laughs> Interesting. It, 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 it's, it's actually, <laughs> it, it's not even subtle. Let, let me put it that way. No. <laughs> it, it, when an atheist phones you up, Pastor, because he wants you to promote something, it, it's not a help to the cause of Christ. I guess that would be the, the, the thing I would well, say. Well put. <laughs> um, you know, so why do these atheists want to promote evolution so much? Well, you know, the year of Darwin, 2009, of course, it was the, the 150th anniversary of Darwin's origin of species and the 200th anniversary of his birth. And, and so this was atheists were, were just all over this. Yes, Yay, yes. here's the guy who killed God, etc. And so um, there were uh, many scientists, uh, I'm going to read you uh, from a, a quote from Peter Lawrence, and this was his response when approached, uh, along with these other scientists, uh, to talk about the, you know, what, what was the impact of Darwin's book uh, on the 150th anniversary of the publication. So here's what Peter Lawrence said, he's an atheist. In this vital mission to discredit the supernatural, nothing has proved more important than the origin of species. Yeah, and uh, Cambridge University evolutionist Simon Conway, Simon Conway Morris, said a similar thing. He said, first and foremost, the origin is an exorcism of the doctrine of special creation and conducted by one of the most skilled exorcists science has ever seen. <laughs> and of course, atheist uh, Jerry Coyne, he, uh, he reinforced this by saying, this was his response when uh, asked with this group of scientists, Darwin, in the end, so convinced his readers that, uh, that they not only bought his ideas, but in the process, jettisoned 
3,000 years of religious explanation for life and its apparent design. Yeah, here's a quote from a popular uh, anti-religious website, anti-Christian website, that made it very clear on why evolution is, is sort of an antidote against belief in God. Right. Uh, here, this uh, butterfly and wheels, butterflies and wheels. The theory of evolution demolishes the best reason anyone ever suggested for believing in a divine creator. This does not demonstrate that there is no divine creator, of course, but only shows that if there is one, uh, or it, he, needn't have bothered to create anything, since, na since natural selection would have taken care of all that. Would the good judge similarly agree when a defense team in a murder trial shows that the victim died of natural causes, that, in th that this in no way conflicts with the state's contention that the death in question uh, had, had an author. A person did it, in other words. Right, so you, you go to court, there's two groups. One says, this person died of natural causes. One person says, no, this, this was caused. But these guys here make an ironclad case showing that everything happened was natural. Could you say that that doesn't harm this? It's just so obvious, <laughs> I guess. You know, so effective has, has evolution been in converting people to atheism that uh, atheists, you know, sure. uh, skeptics.com, yep. one of the largest atheist websites in the United States, they produce a guide, 105 ways to promote skeptical activism. I mean, you want to be a good atheist, you're going to pick up their book and you're going to follow these 105 ways, you know, Christians sometimes think it's just us that have these, you know, kind of programs, right. or whatever. 105 ways to promote skeptical activism. Point number 20 in their booklet, make allies, be cooperative, we need help, build bridges. So here's atheists saying, oh, we, we need to build these bridges. Work with religious groups. Our best allies for defending evolution are members of the mainstream clergy groups. Okay, here's one of the best ways you can promote atheism. Find Christians who believe in evolution, get them to help you promote evolution, will produce more atheists. Yeah, that's because as we said before, evolution provides the basis for atheism. Uh, atheism needs evolution. If you're going to be an atheist, and you still need an explanation for how we all got here. So you have to believe in evolution, no, no matter how bad the science is for it. Um, here's uh, D. Kurtz, he says this, Religious humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not, creation, not created. Humanism believes that man is a part of nature and that he emerged as the result of a continuous process. And non as non-theists, we begin with humans, not God, nature, not deity. And that's straight out of the humanist manifesto, <laughs> right? You're, you're a humanist, you're, you're an atheist. You have yeah. to believe that you're part of a process. So they start with, with humans, not God. It's just an integral part of the worldview, right. uh, so yeah. to speak. And that's perhaps why Bill Provine, a famous atheist and Cornell biology professor said, one can have a religious view that is compatible with evolution only if the religious view is indistinguishable from atheism. Yeah, there's a huge, a huge conflict between creation and the millions of years of evolution. And atheists have pointed this out from, from years back. As, as, here, here's a quote from, from an atheist, Richard Bozarth, from American Atheist Magazine from many years ago. Look at this. Christianity has fought, still fights, and will continue to fight science to the desperate end over evolution, because evolution destroys utterly and finally the very reason Jesus' earthly life was supposedly made necessary. Destroy Adam and Eve and the original sin, and in the rubble you will find the sorry remains of the Son of God. If Jesus was not the Redeemer who died for our sins, and this is what evolution means, then Christianity is nothing. And He's, we, we have to agree with that. I mean, his logic is if, if you destroy Adam and Eve, if you destroy the first Adam, as we said earlier, there's no point in having a second Adam that's right. or a last Adam. Yeah. Uh, it, it does, and, and the atheist, in, in this case, this Richard Bozarth, he's figured that out. And atheists are teaching this truth among themselves. Get rid of the first atom, and you've effectively eliminated the last atom. That's right. So again, you know, when I'm out there, when all CMI speakers are, are out uh, answering these questions from theistic evolutionists, from, from our brothers and sisters in Christ who've accepted evolution, at this point, I don't want to argue with them, but I do like asking them, why? 
if it's so obvious that evolution is so damaging to the gospel, it so is taking so many people away. I mean, if God really did create right. that way, you'd be surprised that it would be something that would you know, take some, have so many people confess that this is why they fell away. Why wouldn't you switch stance and adopt a method of interpretation uh, of the scientific evidence? Because we've got gobs of information on our website. I mean, to show people, hey, look, the, real science supports the Bible. Why wouldn't you swap and go, oh, yeah, you can interpret the evidence according to what God's Word said. Why wouldn't you want to do that? And I'll tell you what I hear right. over and over again. Yeah. It's intellectual integrity. You know, think, well, Cal, listen, it's, it's you know, this is a scientific age. If we don't accept millions of years and, and, and evolution, people are going to think we're boneheads. Yeah, you know, yeah. We're, we're just silly. I mean, we can't believe that, that, uh, that the earth is young and, and, oh, yeah. and that there's yeah. a creator. You, just, you, you'll hear people, yeah. look at Genesis. It's got a talking snake. Obviously, it's, it's just a metaphor. What about the talking donkey? Oops, yeah. What about the floating axe head? What about the guy who walked on water? What about the virgin that gave birth? And on and on and on. What about the dead guy who comes back to life? The, the, the yeah. challenge here is, folks, if, if you're sitting out there thinking, well, you know, I, I need to maintain intellectual integrity. With, with my unsaved, unregenerate neighbor, I need to maintain intellectual integrity by adopting millions of years in evolution. If, if he thinks you'd be an idiot <laughs> because you'd believe, you wouldn't believe in evolution, He's going to think you're an idiot because he, if you believe that the dead guy came back to life. You still have to believe that, right? I mean, but why would you believe that? Because that's not proven scientifically. I mean, well, it's fact, ridiculous. It's disproven. That, that's a miraculous event, completely outside the realm of science. Dead that's people right. who are dead for three days don't come back to life. The water does that. not turn into wine because someone says it does. Humans can't walk on water. Five small loaves and four fishes. It's as mathematically impossible for those to feed 5,000 men. That's right. So, work. so if, if, if you feel like you're going to be looked upon as intellectually small because you believe something that's fantastic, in order to be a Christian, you must believe in fantastic things, right? Because if the dead guy came back to life, then obviously that's outside the realm of science. You accept that on faith, and, uh, and, and it's, it's just not working. Yeah, but it, it is working. Is it working? Um, <laughs> There's, again, BioLogos, if we come back to the, the BioLogos folks here, they're a large organization made yep. up of, of people who self-label themselves as Christians. Um, some of them aren't, clearly, mm -hmm. from their own writings we can see that. But uh, if, you, if you go to their website, right, it's actually, well, we don't, we're not recommending that people go to their website, <laughs> but the comments from atheists who respond to their theistic evolution position, here, here's one of those comments. Right. Since it, secular science, opposes impossible virgin births and impossible re revivification of corpses as much as it opposes a 6,000-year-old earth, BioLogos has no actual principle to stand on when they oppose a literal reading of Genesis, but to support a literal reading of a story with a virgin birth. Exactly. <laughs> They've got you nailed, see? You, you have no principle to stand on to point to one part of the Bible and say, yeah, I'm going to believe this part over here. No, science has disproven that. I'm going to get right. rid of that. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, you can see it all over the comments, not just on their website, but anywhere that this discussion is, is taking place. As soon as you take a, a, a compromised position, the atheist is going to snap up. Right. Yeah. Here's another one, um, uh, more of a layperson's uh, view, I guess, so uh, you could say. Uh, yeah, somehow not buying it. And I would have noted the blatant contradiction even in my Bible-believing days as well. Do you ever get tired of tying yourself into a pretzel trying to ignore obvious, illogical, uh, obvious logical implications and keep others from noting them? It doesn't help. No. They notice it right away. Um, you, you're not helping the cause of Christ by doing this, showing yourself up to be illogical, and then claiming that you're going to do that in order to be, uh, make yourself more intellectually... Right. Uh, it, you, you're tying yourself in, in knots here theologically and logically that's as right. well. Um, if, if you're a theistic evolutionist, consider Romans 1.20. Romans 1.20 says that everything looks like it's been designed. For the invisible things from him, from the creation of the world, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, so that they are without excuse. Right. right? Yeah. But if everything looks like it made itself, then atheists would have an excuse on Judgment Day. Right. Romans so, 120 says it isn't, but that's, that's what theistic evolutionists are saying. Well, look, the evidence for evolution is all around us. Everything looks like it just got here by chance. 
Exactly. So the, the, this Biologus organization, for example, they have scientists. The scientists are saying, yeah, everything looks like it just makes itself. That completely contradicts what God's Word says. Yeah. Yeah. So perhaps it's time to, uh, to lean not on our own understanding, uh, but, but to submit to the Word of God and, and understand that the, you know, these facts for evolution, well, they can be interpreted according to what God's Word says as well. That's exactly what CMI is all about. You can go to our website. I haven't seen any fact that an evolutionist has pre presented that can't be interpreted according to God's Word and probably in a much better way, <laughs> a much more plausible explanation than, than the evolutionary one. Yeah, so why we, would you not adopt that? We've said this many times, it's not an issue of facts. Uh, everybody agrees on the facts, there's no disagreement there. All of the scientific studies, we all agree with those. We disagree with the misinterpretations that line up with the millions of years and so on. Right. Because we know that the millions of years never took place because of scripture and things like Romans 120 and so on. It's the same way I know that um, Mary uh, was, a, was a human female virgin that gave birth, and it's the same reason that I know Jesus rose from the dead, because it's what God's Word says.